afternoon. Happy Friday. We made it to the end of the week. No better way to celebrate than gazing upon a, a Stellar's Jay, a close relative of the, the Blue Jays we have around here. Uh, you can always tell when a Blue Jay is nearby because they have a, a very distinctive call, sort of a <laughs> It's just like they, they look like a very elegant bird. They do not sound like an elegant bird. Um, in addition to this uh, uh, Stellar's Jay, we have a great blue heron. Um, have those around here too. Occasionally you'll, you'll see them on the, the Cannon River. Uh, this is a, a long-tailed uh, duck aptly named uh, for its uh, orange spot on its beak. These are some more ducks, in this case a uh, male and female ring-necked uh, duck enjoying some time on a, on a pond. Here are some, some snow geese parading with uh, uh, military precision. Uh, when you get a close look at a snow goose, it looks like it's kind of just clenching its teeth all the time, but uh, of course it does not have any teeth, just some ridges on the bill, uh, probably to let it shred uh, plants that it wants to eat. And finally, uh, we have a pair of, of painted turtles enjoying the sun, and we'll come back to the Stellar's Jay in a, in a more elegant pose. All right, any questions on the, on the lab, nested lists, uh, files, anything like that to get us started? One thing that I want to show you in VS Code, and there are step-by-step -step instructions for this in the notes for today, uh, is that there's a particular setting when it comes to uh, when it comes to files uh, that can cause some problems. So I uh, want to show you that if we go to, I got to this uh, settings code preferences settings. Um, the menu may be called file if you're on Windows, uh, but then if you type into the search bar python dot um, terminal dot execute um, uh, this option execute in file dir is controls whether VS Code, when you run a Python file, runs it as if you are in the same folder as that file, or as if you are in whatever folder you have open in VS Code, which may not be the same folder as the file you're working with. VS Code has this unchecked by default, which means it will run as if it's in whatever folder you have open in VS Code, this can cause problems if you have some folder above the one where you're working in open, it won't be able to find your files. So if you go to, say, open the uh, CSV file that uh, we're using for lab three, and you're getting messages that can't find the file even though you, you downloaded it, you put it in the same folder as uh, uh, your, your gerrymandering.py, this is likely the setting to blame and go to the notes for today, follow those instructions and we want this box to be to be checked. It's going to make VS Code behave the way we would expect. I always find it frustrating that this is not checked by default, but that is that is life. Questions on that? All right. Let's start out with some practice. <coughs> All right, is this text too small? Can the folks in the back see it? All right, looks good. So I want to write a function, all positive, that It's going to take a list of numbers as its parameter uh, and
and it's going to return true when all the numbers in the list are positive. Otherwise, it will return false. So I have three versions, uh, three attempts at this all positive function uh, here. And uh, I'd like you to work with your neighbors to figure out what is each of these versions going to do based on this, this list uh, uh, nums that it's, it's taking in. Is it going to do what we want, return true, when everything is positive and false. Otherwise, there's going to do something else. So uh, take a few minutes and, and uh, talk over these different versions of this function uh, with your neighbors. Let's talk through these, these different functions. Let's start with uh, attempt number one here. Um, so who can uh, uh, tell us how you're thinking about what this all positive one is going to do? Yeah, Mark. Um, that's just going to accumulate it. So we're not looking to add anything, stop anything. We have a number of sections. It's not a Yeah, so. so uh, it's, a, it's a great point, all positive one. It's looping through our list and adding up all the numbers in it. Um, and so it's not going to tell us this if, if it's all positive or not. What, what will all positive one tell us? What will its true or false indicate? Ezra? It'll be true if the like, net, the net sum is positive and false if it's zero and negative. Exactly. So it's going to be true if the sum of all the things is positive, which is different from all the individual things being positive. All right. So all positive one is going to check if the sum if the sum of the numbers in the list is positive because we have this loop over all the elements that's adding them up. All right, how about, uh, oh, sorry, any questions on, on all positive one? All right, how about all positive two? Uh, is this going to do what we want, something different? How are you thinking about this, Emma? Oh, I think uh, two would return what we want. What makes you think that this is this is the version we want? Because there's an if and else statement. Um, and can I describe three too? Um, I'm kind of going off three and well, because there's an if and else statement, which mm -hmm. means like any number that isn't positive would return false, and that would be negative and zero. So. But since it's anything that's positive returns true, then it's returning anything that's true. It's only anything that's true as positive. There's, or anything that's positive only as true. 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 Oh. Yeah, so you're, you're saying that all positive 2 and all positive 3 are sort of doing the same thing, um, just like with the if-else used differently, or? Um, kind of. Uh, for all positive two, there is an else, um, and it is like in the same indentation mm -hmm. as the if. So um, it goes from if to else, not if, and then it just returns true, like all positive three. All right, so. It's yeah, that's that's some some nice observations that we have an if else that's entirely inside the loop, mm -hmm. and this if and else are connected, uh, and we're returning true when we see a positive number, false uh, when we see something else in all positive two. Um, for all positive two, does anyone can anyone think of an input, like a list we could give it where it might not do the right thing? Um, one where a um, positive number appears before a 
their negative numbers because it was returned. So I think it would return true um, like prematurely. So it's going to call the number. Yeah, that's. This is a, a, a great point that if we call all positive 2 on, let's say, the list with 4 and negative 3, we go into our loop over our list, 4 and negative 3. We assign num to 4. Then we say if num greater than 0, that's true, 4 is greater than 0. Then we get to return true. Now, there are two things that return did inside a function. Anyone remember what those two were? Cool? It, yeah, it, it determines our return value and it ends the function. As soon as we get to a, t a return, the function is over, its return value is set, we don't do anything else inside the function. So our all positive two will tell us whether the first number in the list is positive or not, but it will never check the ones after that because it's always going to return true or false based on that first number. And so this is something we have to be careful of when we have a return inside a loop the first time we get to that return it's going to end the function we're not going to do any more of that loop we're going back to where that function was called so we have to be sure that if we have a return inside a loop that we are kind of when we in the case where we get to that return we need to be sure we're done with that loop, that we wouldn't need to continue uh, uh, iterating. What are your questions on that with, with this all positive two? All right, how about all positive three? We have two different return statements. We have return true on line five there. Is that inside or outside of our for loop? Outside. That, yeah, that's outside of our, our for loop. We can tell because it's not indented uh, from where the for loop is. So that means we would only do this return true once we had gone through all the times, all the iterations of our loop. So, Marka? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm learning all this right now. Just giving me invalid syntax. <laughs> yeah, so this would be one of those times where we don't want to type this into the code and, and try and run it. We want to try and read the code and understand what's going on there and kind of think through what it's going to do rather than asking the computer uh, uh, what, what it's going to do. So for all positive three, uh, volunteer to, to tell us how you're, how you're thinking about, is this going to, to do what we want or, or something else? Eric. So this will do what we want because it's going to go through the list and if at any point it hits a negative, it's automatically going to return a false. If it goes through all of the whole list and doesn't find anything, then it will return true. Yes, that, that, is, that is correct. Uh, and this is a common pattern that we'll see. If we want to check something about uh, the elements in, in a list, we want to put inside the loop kind of the return for as soon as we know something, we're done. We don't need to check any more, any more things. So as soon as we find something that's not positive, well, we know not everything is positive. We know we should return false. Doesn't matter if the rest of the list is positive. As soon as we find that one negative, then we know to return false. And by putting the return true after the loop, 
as Eric said, we only get to that return once we've already gone through every single thing in our loop. We've checked every single thing is it less than or equal to zero. And because return ends the function, the only way we get here is if we never return false before that. Because if we ever return false, the function's done, we're returning false, we won't ever get to the return true. The only way we get to the return true is if num less than or equal to zero was never, was never true. We never went inside that if. Does that make sense? Questions on this all positives, any of these, any of these functions? writing exercise for you. I would like you to write a powers of two function. That takes in a parameter called bases and Bases will be a list of integers, and this function should return a new list to return a new list where every element of that new list is 2 to the power of that element of, of basis. So, for example, if I called powers of 2 of 1, 2, 3, this should return the list 2, 4, 8. 2 to the first power, 2 to the second power, 2 to the third power. A couple additional pieces of information. We don't want to modify our original list bases. That should be unchanged. So if we want to create a new list, we know we have to do equals something with square brackets. Now, a nice way to approach this <coughs> is to start by creating an empty list, something square brackets with nothing in between it, put it in a variable, and then use the append method to add the elements onto our list result that we want, to add these, these powers of two. So, Go ahead and, and give that a try, working uh, on your own or with the folks around you to write a function that's going to return a new list that's based on this parameter basis that, we, that we're getting in. All right, let's talk about how we would uh, build, up this, build up this list. We have bases. Created a new list results. We know that's what we want to return, but in between we need to add on these powers of, of two. So can someone share how how you thought about doing that? Gabby. Um, so I made a loop uh, so after making the result mm -hmm. um, that said four nouns in places. Uh, and I guess you didn't have to make this a separate variable, but I did just because it's stressing out that. Uh, I just called math process and set it equal to two to the power of nums. 
And then I, within the loop, because if you do it without the loop, it'll just keep using the same result from the beginning of the function. So within the loop, I did result.append, math process, and then return the result. Yeah, and let's uh, <clears throat> let's run this. See if uh, we get the expected prints for one, two, three. We get two, four, eight as expected. For five, we get thirty-two. Uh, yeah, so this looks this looks great. Um, this is uh, kind of a nice pattern for how we would write a function that returns a new list. We create an empty one, and then in a loop, uh, append the things we want onto the list. Uh, anything not clear about this? Parts I could could explain. <coughs> All right. So let's switch the. So, so far we have talked about two kinds of sequences uh, in, this, uh, in this class. We've talked about uh, lists uh, and we've talked about strings as a sort of special sequence of characters. And today I want to talk about one more kind of sequence. Uh, lists use Square brackets with things separated by commas, strings use double quotes with characters in between, and we also have a kind of sequence called a tuple. And these use parentheses with commas separating the elements. So the only difference here between lists and tuples is that we're using parentheses. And the key difference for tuples is that like strings, they are what we call immutable, meaning They cannot change. Once we make a string, we saw last time that we can't go in and change a particular letter inside that string. If we want a different string, we have to just make a new string. Lists, we've seen, are mutable. We can mutate or modify them. We, can, uh, we just saw that we could append new things to a list. We've seen that we can use indexing to change what's uh, stored at a particular slot in a list. Um, and tuples, they follow all the same syntax as lists. We can write a loop over them. We can index them. Uh, we can concatenate them. But what we can't do is append new things, remove things, change this for to some other, some other value. So why would we want something that's just like a list but is immutable? There are a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is tuples can be more efficient. And why that is is beyond the scope of this course. But if you, in general, in computing, if we have values that are not allowed to change, the computer system can be more efficient in how it deals with those. Because it, it doesn't have to account for the fact that once one is created, it might later change. If the computer can safely assume that it will never change after we create it. So there's an efficiency reason. And the second, I might call a safety reason, and that's not like physical safety. Tuples aren't protecting us from, from, from that sort of danger. Uh, but they might protect us from a bug in our program. So consider
consider a computer program that was representing uh, coordinates on the Earth, say with longitude and latitude. Now these coordinates uh, should always come in pairs. We should always have a longitude with a latitude. It shouldn't be possible that once we have a coordinate that we somehow lose, remove the latitude or add a third coordinate to our sequence. And so if we say you used a tuple to represent our longitude and latitude rather than a list, it would prevent it from having us accidentally changing the, the adding a third coordinate or, or removing one. And so if we have data that we know we don't want to add new things to a sequence, then a tuple might make sense because it will prevent uh, potential bugs in the program where we would add something uh, and, not, and not mean to. Does that make sense? Any questions about, about tuples or, or why we might want to use them? All right, so before I get into my next topic, I want to uh, wake you up a bit with uh, another practice problem, this one involving strings. So I have a string, uh, Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street, one of my favorite musicals. Um, and there's a loop and an if statement and, and something going on with this variable out. So uh, take a minute and, and think through yourself what, uh, what this might print out. All right. Sounds like some discussion might be helpful. See if with your neighbors you can reason out uh, what what's going on here. All right, we've we've had some some movement, and in this case, the majority has it correct. We are going to get uh, e o e i o e um, as as what's printed out. Um, so let's break down the different the different parts of this. Uh, we have some variables assigned to strings. That's pretty straightforward. Then we have this loop for C in S. So who can tell us what that for loop uh, will do in terms of what is C going to be each time we go around? C will be each character inside the string. Yes, C will be each character inside the string, where our strings are sequences of characters. So we're going to get capital S, and then W, and then E, and then E, and, and, and so on. All right, how about this if statement, if C in targets? Who has a, a thought about what, what that if statement will do? Yeah. Um, is um what well, is like appears in targets then it'll add it to out. Yeah, exactly. That C in targets is a Boolean expression that is true if whatever string C is shows up in the other string targets. And we can see targets is A E I O U, so those will be true for all the all the vowels. Uh, that C might be. How about this out plus equals C? What uh, what is that that line going to do? Ezra? Um, it's going to combine the C, the character, with the empty string out. Yeah, it will concatenate them together, and then what will it do with that result? David. It will save it until the like, loop's all done. Uh, it, it will save it somewhere. Do we know like where specifically it's, it's going to combine out with this, le this vowel, whatever vowel C is, and then it's going to put it somewhere. Do we know where that's going to be? John. Back into out. 
Exactly, that when we have out equals out plus C, I told you that strings were immutable, which means if we have a given string, we can't uh, go in and mess with it. But we also know that when we concatenate two things, strings, lists, tuples, that creates a new one of those things that has the two parts combined. So out plus C, we create a new string that these two things stuck together, and then we put that into out, basically overriding what was there before. So we end up continuing to kind of uh, uh, add on uh, letters to the string that's in out, even though it's a new string each time, we just keep replacing out with uh, a new version. And this shows how we can take one of these uh, pieces of immutable data and sort of build it up over time. Even though we can't append to a string, we can use concatenation to produce kind of new combined strings uh, as, as we need them. Questions on it? Someone? So could we get the consonants out by saying it's C not in targets? Yes, that is, that is a, great, uh, uh, a, a great suggestion. Something that I didn't tell you about the in operator is that we can also say the opposite. It's not in. So we could literally write if C not in targets to check is this letter not appearing anywhere in our string targets. Other questions? Yes, that's, that's a, a good observation. We, we don't have a return. We usually do. Uh, the reason is this code is not inside a function. There's no like def function name uh, above it. It's kind of not indented inside a function definition. Uh, and we would only return only does things inside a function. As it's setting a return value and it's ending the function. And so if we have code that's not in a function, uh, Python won't let us use return. It will give us an error if we try. Does that make sense? Other questions? All right. Let's go to Python Tutor but not that one. And I want to talk to you about an idea called scope. And this is the computer science term for where a variable exists. That is, a variable's scope is the part of the code where that variable exists. And we've talked about this idea without using the word scope. So uh, anyone remember what I said about functions and the variables inside of them? David? That they're their own like, little world. Exactly. Functions are their own little world, which means We would say that variables inside functions have that function as their scope. They only exist inside that function. And we can see uh, uh, an example of uh, how this works. If uh, And this 
would be that this code is is in the notes. So I think it would be helpful to kind of follow along um, uh, uh, visually with code reading rather than than code writing. Um, so if I define a variable x, and then I also have a function square, which takes in a variable that I also called x, and it sets a variable x equal to x times x, returns x, and then I say y equals 10, and then I call square with y, and check did y or x change. So I basically constructed an example where we have a lot of the same name for a variable x floating around, which means the scope of these different variables is going to determine uh, which x we use at a given point, whether it's all the same or, or what. So after this first x equals 5, we have an x that's 5 in, in memory. We define square. We have a function called square. takes a parameter in memory. y equals 10. We get one of those. Now we call square, and we see that functions their own little world. We have this sort of separate box here, which is inside the square function, which has its own x that has been set to 10 because we called square with y, which was currently 10. So this box is how is Python Tutor expressing the scope of our function and that the scope of this x inside the function, we can use it, we can reassign it to x times x uh, and then return it. And Python Tutor shows us that we've set the return value to 100. That gets printed out, but this had no effect on our variable x that it exists outside this function because our function square, the x inside of there, its scope is limited to just inside that function. And so our two variable variables, both names x here, have different scopes and are not affecting one another. And so this is kind of a more formal way of, of describing why functions are their own little worlds. Because in programming, variables have scope, and functions are their own scope, and variables don't, don't, uh, don't escape it. And x and y still 5 and 10. What are your questions on this? All right. We have time for things to get stranger. So I now want to introduce another term, alias. So you may have encountered this word alias uh, if uh, we're thinking about spies or, or criminals, uh, an AKA, uh, a spy might have an alias, a secret identity. And where alias in this case means something similar, it just means another name for the same data. So if we have code where we have a list of three things, and then I set another variable equal to that list, q equals vec. We've seen before that if I did this with numbers, at this point changing vec if it was, say, 10, to 12 wouldn't affect Q. Q would still be whatever we, the number we assign it to. But when it comes to data that has stuff inside it, we end up with uh, having to think about aliasing. And what I mean is if I set Q at index one to seven, 
we might wonder, what is VEC going to be? Is this changing of Q going to change our original list VEC? When we visualize this in Python Tutor, we see we say VEC equals a list of three fives, numbers the slots for us and everything. And when we say Q equal VEC, we're not creating a new list, we're creating an alias. We're creating Q as another name for our list of three fives. And both of these arrows point to the one list that exists. So when I use the Q to modify this list, it changes the one list that exists. So Q equals VEC. That doesn't create a new list, it creates an alias for, for our existing list. And so when I print out VEC, I see that it has changed along with Q. Now, this can only happen because lists are mutable. Like if we set both Q and VEC to a string, we know that we can't go in and change some individual piece of a string. So there would be no way to go in and make a change that affected both. But when things are mutable, then we can use one alias to affect the data that, that, that multiple things refer to. All right, there's uh, any, uh, what, what are your questions on uh, aliasing so far? So we can actually dig into the details here a bit, and we can look at uh, some code that I have I have written here. So I set x to a string, and y equals to x, a to five, b equals to a. Um, so what I'm actually going to do. This is not what I want. Uh, I want to set x equal to 5. I'm going to set y also equal to 5. And then I'm going to use a built-in function in Python called uh, id, which uh, gives us a unique number for any piece of data. It has a unique identifier, a unique id. And in this, in the standard Python implementation, this unique number is actually the spot in the computer's memory where that data lives. So we can use this ID function to check where in the computer's memory does a particular value live and see if it's the same or different as where some other, some other uh, thing is living. So I'll set both x and y to 5, and then see, do they have the same ID? So they're both sitting here as 5. I get this long number, this, a spot in the computer's memory. All the spots get their own numbers. This one uh, looks like that. And I get the exact same number for x and y, which means that there is actually just a 1 5 sitting in the computer's memory, and both x and y are labeling that same 5. Python Tutor actually has a, a setting we can change to uh, see this a little clearer. And it says, show us all, all the stuff that's in, that's in memory as sort of separate things. So we can see x and y are actually both arrows to the same 5. And the weirdness that I was alluding to is what happens when we do x equals 6. Because we have been thinking, and it's a useful way to think about computers, lets us make accurate predictions, that when we say x equals 5, we put 5 somewhere in memory and label it with x. And then when we say x equals 6, we're changing that 5, we're replacing it with a 6, and we're still labeling that slot x. But what actually happens is we're moving the label 
to the place where six is rather than moving six to the place where our label X is. So if we dig into the guts of Python as actually doing something uh, uh, stranger than, than the sort of useful, intuitive view that we, that we built up so far in this course. And we, and we can see by the IDs that the ID of X has changed. The spot in the computer's memory that, it, that it's labeled, that it labels, has moved uh, as, we, as we changed its value. So the reason that I, I'm showing you this is because part of, of this course is sort of uh, peering kind of beyond the, the veil of computer systems and, and starting to understand a little bit about what is going on underneath. I think it's still, when we're thinking about what our programs are doing, still very helpful to think of it in the way that we started out, where we have a slot and it's labeled and we replace the thing in that slot. But at, uh, especially if you continue uh, in computer science beyond 111, uh, there's all sorts of, of interesting stuff going on beneath the surface. All right. That'll do it for this week. The quiz, uh, uh, week four quiz is posted just like the week three quiz. There are three functions that you're implementing with tests on Gradescope. Uh, post questions on the form, and I will see you Monday.